Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Yeah. Please take your seat. We're about to start. We have a very, very packed agenda today. So uh, on behalf of uh, Information Today, uh, a really warm welcome uh, to the ChemWorld Conference, which include the Enterprise Search, Taxonomy, and Text Analytics. My name is Jean-Claude Monet. I'm gonna be your host for this three-day conference. And um, I was the former Chief Knowledge Officer for Microsoft. And um, I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be here and uh, help host this conference. Uh, but before we start, um, the program director, uh, <coughs> Jean Dysart, would like to say a few words. So, if uh, Bill, you can roll the video. Good morning and welcome to KM World 2022. I'm Jane Dysart, Program Director for over 20 years of KM World. I'm very disappointed not to be with you in person today due to health reasons, but there's a whole host of people who are there to help you and inspire you, and I hope you have a great conference. Brian Fishman is the program coordinator, and along with Information Today conference producer staff, they will take very good care of you. We also have, within our KM world, three other events going on, Taxonomy Boot Camp, with Stephanie Lemieux as conference chair, Search and Discovery with Mary D. Ojala as conference chair, and Text Analytics Forum with Tom Remy as conference chair. I want to thank all our sponsors for uh, being here and supporting us, and you will meet them in the Enterprise Solutions Showcase. I want to thank our moderators for keeping track of uh, speakers and supporting them because they are here from all over the globe to share their knowledge and experience. I want to thank all of you in the audience for being here as well. I know it's taken a great effort uh, to be here the first time in three years in person again in DC, and we are so happy to be here. Last but not least, I want to introduce the host while I'm not there. Jean-Claude Monet is a longtime and passionate KMer, but Jean-Claude is going to be with you every morning to introduce our sponsors and he will be circulating and want to chat with you all. So please introduce yourself to all these people that I've mentioned. Have a great time, enjoy, learn, network, have fun. Thanks so much. Take it away, Jean-Claude. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Well, um, those of us who have been here for many years, we refer to, to Jane as uh, the KM mom for us. Uh, she's been, uh, she's been uh, doing this for over 20 years and uh, that shows uh, grit and passion and uh, determination from a person. So I think uh, she has uh, really contributed to our discipline greatly and uh, we're very thankful uh, there. So um, just for the show of hand, how many of you at uh, first game world here? Can you show me? So my, I'm processing my AI, I would say 37%. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, it's good. I think, uh, if anything, KM World, uh, we need to uh, practice what uh, our discipline tells us, which is to connect, to share, to learn, and repeat that as often as you can, because at the end of the day, in your professional life, you're only as good as your personal network. When you face a problem, it's good to be able to reach someone and basically be able to get an advice you can trust. So I think this is the opportunity there. You've seen we have a great set of sponsors, so I want to thank them again for uh, helping us make even a, a richer conference. 
uh, there, uh, all the sponsors, all the people that are there. Uh, I think it's, um, it's a great, great thing. So I need a bit of logistics and your help. Um, we're going to have four um, uh, keynote there. Uh, so we're going to have to uh, make sure that we leave the room at the end of the fourth keynote so we can repartition this room in the three different tracks uh, that we have for the, for the conference. Um, the, uh, the theme of the conference, uh, you might have noticed or not noticed on your, on your brochure, is very much in line with what we are experiencing today in the workplace. Uh, some of you might have the word, the great reshuffle. And that's exactly what is happening there. Uh, we are losing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the human connection there. And I would say that uh, companies are really struggling to grow or even maintain their social capital. So last night at the, at the party, I was meeting someone who has just joined a company for six months. And she told me, well, I've never met my colleagues. And I said, how do you build social capital when you don't meet people, right? And she said, well, you have to be intentional. And I said, tell me more. What does it mean you have to be intentional? She said, every week, I have a list of people that I reach out to and introduce myself, do the meet and greet, try to you know, build that. And I think it was a good idea, so I wanted to share, share this with you because I think it's, um, it's an interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> we talk also about, about diversity. Well, this conference has uh, people from 25 countries, uh, six continents out of the seven. So I think it's very interesting to see that it's a very worldwide audience here. Uh, just please reach out to people who come from, from a different country as you. They have a different perspective. Uh, you might be working for a global company, and that's always good to you know, get a little bit of the culture of, of other company there. So thanks again to LucidWork, who did sponsor uh, the, uh, the showcase uh, last night. Uh, that was really, really great, and uh, even when the, the light was starting to dim, people would not leave the room, so I could feel the passion again to be in person in a conference, which has been way too long, even though Kim World managed to keep uh, the conference alive for two years on, on remote, but this feels good to be here, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, last minute changes always happen, so please check online for the last uh, minute program changes. Online, you also have the link to how to download the presentations. If speakers put the presentation on it, you can do that. By the way, you also can access the previous year's presentation. So it's a really nice knowledge base of presentation. So you can, you can, see, uh, you can see those there. Um, the showcase session uh, will run for two more days, so today, today and uh, Wednesday, but Thursday won't be running. So please make sure you go there. It's your opportunity to see the product in action, talk to the uh, If you are a customer of one of those companies, it's good to meet uh, some of the people there and give them feedback also, because more feedback you give them, better they can uh, serve you and enhance their product there. Um, today's session, uh, all the rooms are on this level, so it's easy. Uh, the tracks are listed on the screen, so I'm not going to read that for you. And uh, please finally visit the bookstore. We have some great books there, and authors will be signing books there also. I think last night uh, <coughs> there was a person who says, well, you know, why, why would I buy a book, I can hire you as a consultant. And I said, well, when you do that, you can only ask the question of what you know. In a book, you find things that you don't know, because you don't know what you don't know, so you cannot ask it. So there is a little bit of a value in buying books, and I found myself always uh, you know, uh, learning something because I don't know everything. So it's always good, even after 40 years being in the, in the knowledge management uh, arena, I learn every day. So please buy books. Uh, those people are really uh, very insightful uh, there. Uh, program today, so there is no, no, <coughs> me, no surprise. Uh, the four keynote there, as I mentioned, 
And uh, so I will make sure that we keep on track. I've got a good cooperation with my speaker. Where is Dave? Is, uh, where is Dave? Oh, here. Okay. So, uh, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dave Snowden. Dave is a long-term you know, practitioner there. He's a chief scientist at uh, Cunivan. And so, Dave, take it away. There's always this moment of panic as to whether it will actually work, even if you tested it. Um, firstly, I'd just like to add to that sort of tribute to Jane. Jane has been KM World for years. Um, but I've actually keynoted at every single KM World um, since it started in California. And one year I said to her, look, I really can't make it this time. I'll have to come in virtually. And she said, OK, but you'll regret it. And I discovered afterwards that I actually presented through a pumpkin on the stage and I wasn't aware of it while I was doing it, all right? <laughs> and, I, and she said afterwards, you'll never do that to me again. And I have, you know, religiously turned up on demand ever since. Right? Um, my goal is, the opening keynote um, is important because it helps set a tone and I want to really pick up on this theme about people. Um, that we live, as the Chinese say, in interesting times, all right? And I wanted to start off with that gaping void cartoon, which I think is actually quite an important one. Um, you know, I speak here from my own Catholic background. To give up on hope is a mortal sin. Um, but to quote another friend of mine, um, kind of like, you don't have to be optimistic. This is a brilliant book by Terry Eagleton called Hope Without Optimism. Yeah, and that you don't have to be sort of all lovey-dovey and everything's going to be fine. You have to deal with the hard issues. And his other book, which I'd recommend, is Radical Sacrifice. Um, we are, as a species, as a planet, as a nation, or whatever, going to have to make a series of sacrifices to survive over the next few decades. And we need to start to think about that. And knowledge management has a very large part to play in that. But it could both enable it and it, can, it could inhibit it. And so what I want to do in this session is to really go back to a mixture of old and new. I think I'm on about the fourth cycle of knowledge management adoption now. Uh, this is the problem that's come with age. I've seen it you know, adopted and then it abandons itself and then it comes back again. One of the reasons it keeps coming back is its function is very important. But the practice never matches the aspiration. And one of the reasons is actually the practice is too aspirational, it's not pragmatic enough. Yeah, in the workshop I gave yesterday, I talked heavily on a theme we've been running for years now from complexity theory, that you need to start journeys with a sense of direction rather than setting goals. Because if you start journeys with a sense of direction, you're open to the emergence of novelty on the pathway. If you have goals, you effectively get goal blindness. You're entirely focused on that. And again, I said in the workshop yesterday when people are saying, how do we measure care and maturity or how we decide when a program is successful? Well, the minute you decide what success counts in advance or you actually a human maturity model, you're automatically undermining the whole purpose of knowledge management, which is to discover novelty, not what you expected to find. And there's a degree of contradiction in that. So that's going to be a theme of today. And I want to pick up here. I was in Florence last week. It's wonderful to be traveling again. Yeah? and even going to Azerbaijan in two weeks. I've never been there before, so that's really cool, all right, to find Baku. Um, I was in Florence, which, as you know, is a home of the Enlightenment. And a theme several of us are now starting to... Sorry, of the Renaissance. A theme several of us are starting to pick up now is that what we need, you know, is a Renaissance, not an Enlightenment. Now, that difference is a really important one. In the Renaissance, they discovered much of what had been valued in the past but then re-energized it in the present. If you come into the Enlightenment and it's an attempt to say we will abandon everything which went before and start again. Yeah? And Vico, who's a famous Italian philosopher of the Enlightenment, eminently readable in translation, basically turns to the Enlightenment philosophers and says, look guys, it's really good what you're doing, but why are you throwing away everything we already knew? 
I was in Australia about four or five weeks ago. We're doing a huge amount of work at the moment with indigenous people, combining our research methods with the indigenous methods. If you haven't read Tyson's book, Sand Talk, go and read it. And there's a huge amount of knowledge and insight in that about the way we manage the planet, the way we manage our communities, the way we manage interactions, which we've actually lost in a modern technocentric society. Uh, and nobody's saying we should go back to that, although if anybody wants to know how to kill and cook an emu in accordance with sacred tradition, I've done it. I never want to do it again, um, but I can tell you about it. All right? um, fundamentally, we're not saying we want to go back to that sort of society, but we don't want to lose the knowledge which came from it. Right? And that knowledge of the past is key. And one of the things that COVID has done is it's made us realize the radical limitations of virtual collaborative environments. Yeah, which KM has heavily depended on over the years. And, it's not that, and it was okay before because we met as well. And then we had this two-year period where we couldn't meet. And then we start to discover the limitations. Yeah? And hybrid works if hybrid has both aspects present, not if it's only one. If you don't know it, pheromones are significant in human determination of trust. And has anybody ever picked up a scent from a Zoom call? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you don't get the stimulation that you expect. One of the reasons that I think things like Meta are going to fail is they're making the classic mistake that we've seen ever since the 1980s in technology of trying to replicate a physical environment in a virtual environment. You see the storm in Second Life. And the trouble is that misses the opportunities. Yet yeah, you don't get the stimulation you expect to get. You're mo monitoring this avatar around, but you're not getting the feedback you get in reality. Yeah, so it confuses you. If we look at the work I, Wendy, and Tracy and other people did when I was in IBM, we focused on using design, design of IT environments to create connections between people in which they saw connections without having to manipulate an avatar to do it. And one of the big issues on this sort of approach is how do you use technology to augment the connectivity between human beings rather than trying to replicate a physical environment in the virtual, which you actually can't do a priori. Uh, Larry Prusak, who I worked with for years and is a great friend, one of the greats in knowledge management, famously said, if you have a dollar to spend on knowledge management, spend one cent on the technology and 99 cents on connecting people. And that is as true today as it was true then, but we don't do that because we're uncomfortable with that sort of connections. Yeah, particularly connections which make us think or disturb us. And we really need those in knowledge management. We need to be in positions where we're inherently uncomfortable and we're out of our comfort zone. We're not sure we really understand it. And there's a lovely phrase, so you're going to get a few biblical quotes today from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And now I see as through a glass darkly to a greater truth that lies beyond. It's a lovely phrase. Yeah? Because it means I can't fully see where I want to go, but I can sense there's somewhere I should go. Yeah? So a plea to people in knowledge management is to be prepared to see through the glass darkly, to accept uncertainty, to accept disturbance, to accept the way you move forward. And that's not just an excuse for me throwing a whole bunch of stuff at you in a minute which will confuse you, but I thought I'd get that partly out of the way now. Um, if you look at the Enlightenment thinkers, th this guy is René Descartes. Um, Descartes created the famous dualism between the mind and the body. Yeah? Um, if you read Mary Midgley or others, she says the reason he did it is it created a space for science and a space for the church so he could avoid an auto de fe. And I think that's a reasonable one. I mean, it was a serious possibility for him at the time. Um, but that dichotomy has stayed with us ever since. We have this belief, you see it in the AI world, you know, they talk about the singularity. Anybody heard about the singularity? It's this moment in the future where we can transfer our, our consciousness to a, a machine. Well, if you really believe that, your brain has probably degenerated to the point where for you it might be possible. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the reality is that consciousness we now know, this is post-Cartesian views, is a distributed function of the brain, the body, and its social interactions. We use collective narrative to store knowledge and consciousness. We're the center of a distributed, highly complex, unbounded network of meaning. And we need to recognize that. There isn't a brain sat in a body which you can replace. This is why people like me and others now have stopped using the phrase mental models, because it's a computer version of the human brain, 
a huge amount of the way you make decisions is actually in your body, in, your in the chemical environments. There are as many nerve endings in your stomach as there are in parts of your brain. Yeah, and that does actually play a part in it. Although I should warn you, if you ever go to Serbia, do not accept you know, waiters filling up glasses with Serbian brandy because then your stomach and your brain create a completely different relationship. I'm still partly recovering from that. Right? So we get that sort of concept, and this separation of mind and body is a real problem. And you see people say they assume everything is a cognitive issue. It's why I hate the idea of mindsets, which I don't believe people's minds are set. And it's a great excuse. I put this, this huge, great KM program. Isn't it wonderful? We perfectly designed it. We had the right consultants. And nobody's cooperating. Ah, they didn't have the right mindset. You know, it's their fault. Right? It's the wrong way of seeing things. We need to see things much more in terms of the affordances which are provided you by your education, by the company, by the environment. We need to see it in terms of the amount of agency that you actually get. How, much, how many decisions can you actually make? That's actually an important part of fact, fact of this. And also this concept is a delusing concept of assemblage, which is the stories which create patterns into which we fall. Yet you can't escape the patterns of the stories of society to which you belong. They're part of what you are in terms of the way they work. So we need to get a much more sophisticated version of how we see the world as it goes. And kind of like the other, this is John Locke, who started to talk about innate human practices. Um, one of my famous experiments in IBM was when I proved that Myers-Briggs had less accuracy in predicting team behavior than astrology. Now, I'm, I'm still quite proud of that one. It was a program over three months, and for some reason, HR got quite irritated about it. Um, but the reality is that Myers-Briggs is clearly established as a pseudoscience, along with spiral dynamics and all of those sort of frameworks, because actually, we're, we're people in context. We change on the context of interactions. We're not pre-given. And one of the key lessons I want to give you, and this comes from complexity science, is how people connect is more significant than who they are. The connections you make result in radical changes, and it's easy to manage connections, and it's ethical. Trying to change people or get into their minds is another matter altogether. So it's more efficient to change the connectivity, and I'll give you some examples of this as we go. So I'm going to do this kind of like in three sections. Um, first of all, I want to do a reminder of some basics. I'm using the image there, by the way, of a potter. I think knowledge management and technology in general, and my whole background is in technology. I've built three software products over my lifespan. I've built decision support systems. Um, and I came from that environment before I even got into KM. So this is addressing everybody in a sense. And I do a lot of work now with the agile community. We need to see all of ourselves as craft in terms of the way we work. And a craftsperson has the, this, what, what's called, Aristotle called prenesis, practical wisdom, knowledge of the fingertips. They've learned their trade by going through an apprenticeship over time. They know how to do things without thinking about it. But they also have theoretical knowledge. They know about the, 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 the makeup of the, of the clay. And that's what Aristotle called Sophia. Yeah, you need theoretical knowledge and practical wisdom, and the two need to go together you can't have one without the other. And that's something I'm going to advocate as we go through this. So many years ago, um, in a presentation in Basel, I got really angry with one of the big consultants claiming that they can make all tacit knowledge explicit. Um, well, you've got to remember, this is in the 90s. People genuinely thought that. And the Narka's Seki model assumed that you could do it. I mean, he hadn't read Polanyi because Polanyi says that no explicit knowledge can exist without a significant tacit component. Yeah, human beings need to know things in that sort of way. So either way, I devised three rules, and they've, they've stood the test of time. There's seven in all, but I'm just going to do the three main ones. The first one is knowledge can only ever be volunteered. It cannot be conscripted. You can't make people share their knowledge because you'll never know whether they're doing it or not. You can make them share information, but whether they use their knowledge or share their knowledge is another matter altogether. Fear of abuse is a far more significant factor in knowledge retention than the idea that knowledge is power. Most people with real knowledge will share it freely, provided they can have some influence on its use. 
Yeah, the people who try and hold on to things and won't share it generally don't have anything in the first place, in my experience. Yeah, but the reality is what you don't want is somebody to abuse it because then you all get the blame, right, in terms of the way it works. We learned that the hard way in IBM. We had a private area where we developed our work on narrative and we shared all our failures because the people in that group were people we knew and trusted. And then somebody in IBM found it and said, oh, you can't have this, you've got to make it formal. So we spent the whole weekend stripping stuff out of it, all the failures, and making it available for IBM. And then we created a new web database for IBM. And we took our private area outside of IBM because we wanted to carry on sharing failure with people we really trusted. And we knew that if we put it in IBM's knowledge management system, people would take it and use it without training and supervision. And if it worked, they would claim the credit. And if it failed, they would give us the blame. Now, you're going to find me get very cynical as I go through this because the cynics are the people in the company who care and they tell the truth. Right? That's the reality you need to recognize in terms of the way it works. The second one um, is we only know what we know when we need to know it. Human knowledge is deeply contextual. I used as a game in IBM to put executives in a room with a pad and paper and say, please write down everything you know. It was quite entertaining, really, right? Um, they'd freeze after about five to 10 minutes. The reality is you can never write down everything you know. And just to give you the facts on this, the amount of your knowledge which can actually be written down anyway is less than about five or 6%. And the huge dependency of AI and machine learning and technology on written text is deeply problematic because the amount we can write down is actually quite limited. And that leads us into starting to think about apprentice models. We know, for example, with London taxi drivers, I mean, we have this quaint concept in the UK that we should train taxi drivers. It's a unique feature of London. The way they're trained is they drive around the streets of London for two and a half years minimum with a map of London strapped to the handlebars of a motor scooter until they know the name of every street. And London's a big city. And the exam is to be given any two points in London, and you have to actually describe the route from memory, turn by turn, with every major landmark out and back. It has a 40% pass rate over multiple efforts, and the hippocampus of a London taxi driver is significantly larger than other human beings. There's a whole body of human knowledge which requires physical change for you to be able to use it. Right, that was one of the first things that we found in that, is the whole concept of embodied knowledge, uh, which is of increasing importance. So basically, there's things that I can do, I know, but I can't even articulate them. Then there are the things that I can articulate, narrative, storytelling. I'm going to spend a bit of time on that in a minute. I come from an oral tradition in Wales. One of the things which went wrong in Europe is we wrote the fairy stories down. So now we look back and they're quaint. Whereas actually they were designed for the oral tradition and they would develop and change to manage the current context of society. And actually one of the things I'm going to argue in a minute is one of the roles of knowledge management is to resurrect the oral tradition in a scalable way because there are things that we can hold in story form that can never be codified anyway. Yeah, look at all religious textbooks teach through stories. They don't give you explicit goals and structured processes, they tell you stories in fact, some people use the phrase homo narrans, with the storytelling apes. Uh, narrative is a key part of the way we work. So hold that one. What we can write down is a limited aspect of what we know. And then the final one, um, we, sorry, I've actually done the final one there, so sorry about that, I'm getting out of sequence. We only know what we need to know is based on stimulation. So has anybody ever you know, said, I'll sleep on it? Right? If you're sleeping on something, you're engaged in a highly complex chemical process between the long-term and the short-term memory, which will actually bring back knowledge you thought you'd forgotten. Right? That, tech, that stimulation is actually really important. Um, I've got textbooks. I'm dyslectic. All right? If you're dyslectic, you sort of read whole pages. So I have this very complicated schema with four different colored pens to force me to read text line by line you know, in a structured way. But one of the things about that is I can go back to a textbook from 50 years ago and find something in a few seconds. Because I've almost got like a muscle memory of the book when I open it up and I've marked the book so I can find things. And I've got a much richer context. Yeah? But the stimulation 
is being asked a question. I don't know what I know in the absence of the question or in the absence of a context. And the trouble is when we do knowledge audits and knowledge management, we actually make the same mistake. We just assume people can write down what they know or for systems requirements capture, we assume that people know what they need in the new system when we go along and interview them. And by the way, you know, 101 Cognitive Neuroscience, if you conduct more than two interviews, then your brain forms a subconscious hypothesis and you only hear things that match that hypothesis thereafter. Right? That's just truth. And how many of you rely on interviews to discover what people know? Yeah, it doesn't matter how much you structure it, that's actually a part of the way that we think and act. So, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the role of narrative. Um, and also, by the way, one of the places I teach with is a Grand École in, Paris, in um, the south of France, has chalkboards. You know, those big roller chalkboards with different colored chalks. The fascinating thing is writing with chalk slows you down to the pace of the audience. Flashing up bullet points don't. So our modern equivalent is the eye pencil. It's not as much fun as chalk. Yeah, and it doesn't leave debris all over a tweed jacket, which you have to wear for authenticity in professorial environments, but that's life. So this is a map from Max Boisseau. Uh, we originally drew this on a tablecloth in Stiges when we were having conversations. If you haven't read Max Boisseau's Knowledge Assets, it's one of the classics of knowledge management, and it's true today as it was true then. He died prematurely of cancer, and I still miss him. So basically, I just need to make that a bit smaller. Basically, he came up with a thing called the eye space. So this is called abstraction, and this is called codification. Now, it's going to be easier to understand if I give you examples. The London taxi driver is here. Very low abstraction, very low codification. The taxi driver just knows things. Yeah? which is why it's very difficult to communicate. At the opposite extreme, we have the map. A map is highly coded, it's highly structured, it's got a whole semiotic structure. In the UK, we have maps. We're the most mapped country in the world. The whole of the country is down to nine inches to a mile. If you look at a map, a square with a cross is a church with a tower. A dot with a cross is a church with a steeple. You can look at a map and pick things up very quickly for navigation. Now, maps are valuable because anybody can pick them up and use them with minimum training, but they can also be dangerous. Uh, the first time I ever went to New York, yeah, and I was staying in Tarrytown, which is north of New York, if you know the geography, uh, Tarrytown residents are the results of 20 years of inbreeding between IBM and Reader's Digest stuff, uh, with all of the consequences which come from that. Right? Um, and because I'm in New York for the first time, I want to go to the opera. And I get tickets for the opera at the Met, and if I got tickets in that part of the Opera House in London, I'd have to wear a dinner jacket. Yeah, so I get to Tarrytown, I brought the dinner jacket, the black tie, I go into, you know, take the, the Hudson Valley line into New York, get off at Grand Central, walk down to IBM's place in Park Avenue, get laughed at all day because I'm wearing the dinner jacket with a black tie, but I don't mind. Go north on the red line to Lincoln Center, wonderful performance of Trovatore, I get laughed at again then because I'm the only one in the dinner jacket, but it meant that I had lots of drinks bought for me in the interval, so that was useful. And came out of it and realized that the next train going north from Grand Central Station to Tarrytown, this is in the 1980s, by the way, just to give you the context, was actually going in 10 minutes' time. Now, if you know New York, you know you can't do Lincoln Center, Grand Central in 10 minutes. I didn't want to hang around there for another hour, so I looked at the map, the safe, reliable, codified, highly abstract stuff. And it said if I jumped back on the red line and went north, I could get off at 125th Street and walk across two blocks and get the Hudson Valley line going north. And I remember 125th Street because when you're in a strange city, you always remember the stop before the one you have to get off at. So I thought that makes sense, so I did it. Now, I remember the first time I told this to Larry, and he looked at me with this expression of total horror. And I should tell you, in the 1980s, it was a major error to get off at 125th Street at 11.15 at 9, wearing a dinner jacket with an expensive IBM computer slung over your shoulder and a white skin. Yeah, and I'm walking down the street, realizing that life could get very dangerous very quickly, but I know to walk confidently because that might work. And a police car drew me up and said, buddy, what the, are you doing here? 
And he said, I'd only live because nobody could believe that anybody was that stupid. <laughs> and he said, so I picked you up so they thought you were a police plant just to discourage them from mugging other people, all right? Either way, I told this story the next day at Armagh, and they looked at me again with horror, and they said, didn't you know, no, you shouldn't do that? And I said, the map doesn't say here be muggers and other strange beasts. <laughs> the map says if I get off here and do this, I can get north. And that's the real problem with highly codified knowledge management. You have to make so many assumptions that what about what people know. If they don't share those assumptions, you've got a major issue. And actually, a lot of the time there, when I'm working in this area, I say, is it a problem for a taxi driver or is it a problem for a map? And that's the use of metaphor, which is much easier than tacit or explicit, which require explanation. Now, the other thing around this is that narrative sits in a halfway house between the two. I've just told you some stories. I guarantee you will remember the stories, even if you don't remember the fact. Narrative handles the communication between deeply tacit knowledge and deeply explicit. And that comes back to I know more than I can tell, I can tell more than I can write down. The other thing about narrative is we share failure through narrative. Now, how many of you have got children? How many tell them bedtime stories? Do the bedtime stories basically say, you know, um, Dick and Jane stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, you know, paid due reverence to the family mission statement or purpose statement, yeah, and achieve their KPIs on a regular basis. And anybody do that sort of story? Now, basically, the stories have them doing all sorts of terrible things. Yeah, we have a happy ending because we do want them to sleep at night. But we hold the happy ending off for as long as possible so we can terrify them half to death. And they enjoy it. And actually, the human brain pays more attention to failure than it does to success. All storytelling traditions worldwide do not a best practice databases, they're worst practice databases. Because there is more learning in failure than there is in success, and you can use, you can use fiction in order to communicate fact. Yeah, we now build negative story databases for companies because they have more value. We don't define a single purpose we agree the stories of what we don't want to be, which creates some boundaries, but we leave open the possibility of what we can be to discovery in a process. So narrative is not so much about storytelling. In fact, it's very little about storytelling. It's mostly about anecdotes and fragments and structures and memories and those sort of things. We've actually been working on this around COVID. And this is kind of like some of our work. This is called the fitness landscape. This is capturing thousands of stories from across the whole organization. Yeah, looking at things like culture or attitudes to KM or attitudes to safety. And then drawing those maps. And as you can see from the map, in this particular one, I've got some very distinct cultural patterns within that. Right? So instead of actually trying to interview people, I do this indirect approach. I draw the maps and I can see the patterns in the map. Now, this is actually powerful because it shows there's this group here, which is an outlier. And finding outliers is key because they may have seen something that you didn't expect to see in a different way. The famous experiments on this, if you give radiologists a batch of x-rays, on the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. On average, 83% of radiologists will not see it even though their eyes physically scan it. Yeah, you do not see what you do not expect to see. Right? This is called finding the 17%, finding the people who see differently. It's also a whole new theory of change. But if I decide that is desirable, I can click on this mod framework. Sorry, go back on that. I can click on that. Yeah. OK, remember the model underneath, all right? I can click on that framework, and I can look at the stories which underpin it and say, what can we do tomorrow to create more observations or stories like these and fewer like those? If I go to a group of nurses, we've done a lot of work in the medical sector, and I say, how do you improve patient safety? They'll get defensive. If I've captured patient stories, and we've been doing this for years now, and say, how can I create more patient stories like these and fewer patient stories like those, everybody can engage. Yeah? And that final picture is from work we've been doing on COVID, and we're now actually making it easy for companies to gather all the stories of what happened for good or bad during COVID. 
And we're building those as narrative databases. And it's something that's really important to do, to be honest, because it's a seminal moment in our history as organizations. And that's one of the books we've produced. It's called The Sacred Story Book. We haven't just had a narrative database. We've picked the stories and weaved them with images so that people have a physical, tangible object by which they can remember the process. You want to know more about that? We've got stuff on the stand. But it's this realization that narrative has more meaning than a structured analytical text in terms of the way things work. So that's kind of like narrative in terms of the way it works. So what I now want to do is to go through a couple of frameworks. Two of them I'm just going to mention because they're well published and available, but at least you'll be aware of them. There's another Renaissance image there, by the way, of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, if anybody buys me a drink afterwards, I'll tell you about the rather difficult occasion when I first went there, but I'm not going to do that in public. Right? Um, but basically, there are three core frameworks in what we call naturalizing sense-making. So sense-making is defined as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. And there's that concept of sufficiency in it. We never know everything we need to know, but we need to know what level of confidence we have to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Naturalizing, and I've drawn hints at this all the way through, is to use natural science as a constraint. I just gave you an example from cognitive neuroscience. We know that seven, only 17% will see gorillas, so we don't assume we can train everybody to see the gorilla because we can't. Yeah, and we build systems accordingly. So that's kind of like a different approach. So there are three core frameworks within the work we do. One is Kinevin, which is reasonably well known now. Uh, that was originally developed in the context of knowledge management, a paper, Complex Acts of Knowing, uh, which is actually the ninth most cited in the field, um, actually talks about the role of informal communities and formal systems in IBM. And by the way, the ratio was 1 to 64 when I did the work. For every formal community, there were 64 informal communities. And that led us into a whole body of work on how do we generate informal networks across silos. Rather than trying to break down silos, we build networks between them so that the knowledge can flow more easily. Right, so that's what that paper was about. And that's the Kinevin framework. Uh, then we have what's called flexious curves. Uh, that's about market life cycle, and that applies to organization as well. If your company has just adopted a massive new change program, you have to wait for it to fail, and by the way, it will fail, uh, before you can introduce a new idea. Yeah, there's a time where you can do things. That's my quote from Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes, you, know when, you need to know when the moment is right to make change. And then fi finally, the one I'm going to spend a bit more time on, uh, we're still debating whether this has a Welsh name or not, is called the estuary model or the estuarine framework. The trouble is in Welsh, we have eight different words for estuaries because we have a lot of them, so we distinguish between them. So there's a debate going on about what we would call it. This is the latest one, the one I'm most excited about, and it's all about identifying where you can actually change things anyway. So that's what I'm going to finish off on in a few minutes. So the Kinevin framework, recently um, the, the EU field guide on complexity management, there's a QR code on the stand. You can download that for free. You can get a hard copy for free if you just pay for postage. If you're a European citizen still living in Europe, you, can get, you don't even have to pay the postage. Right? Uh, that was based on the Kinevin framework, and it basically goes through a highly structured planned process of how you manage complex and chaotic environments. It was written during the height of COVID with those sort of examples. And the Kinevin framework identifies three fundamental types of system Ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. So ordered systems are highly structured and predictable. Complex systems are deeply entangled and unpredictable. And chaotic systems are near, near random. If you want a metaphor for this, think about solid, liquid, and gas. Yeah? Um, when you heat, remember, everybody remember latent heat from high school? OK, well, assuming if one or two of you don't, I'll just help out here. Yeah, when you heat water up to 100 degrees, it doesn't immediately become steam. You have to put more heat in before it changes. That's called a phase shift. It always warms up a bit before snow because heat is being thrown out as a liquid becomes a solid. Right? So the boundaries between those are phase shift transitions. And you may also remember there's a thing called the triple point, a point where it's equiprobable whether something will become solid, liquid, or gas. Right? In Kinevin, that's called the apparatic domain. Now, that will be a new word to most of you. Um, apparatic comes from Derrida. 
But David Derrida famously said, if you know the answer to a question, it's not a question, it's a process. The only valuable questions are ones to which you do not know the answer until you think differently about the problem. And on the open source wiki, we have aesthetic, linguistic, and physical aporia, things you can do to put people into position where they have to think radically differently. And that's the central domain of Kinevu. And of course, in the order domain, you can apply best or good practice. In the complex domain, doing what worked in the past will never work again. So you have to do something novel. And sort of chaos gives you the same sort of opportunity. Now, there's a lot published, so let's not go, go into it. But the best way of understanding the distinction that I've ever created is imagine if you can, and I'm sure many of you have got this experience, you're organizing a party for a bunch of 11-year-old kids. Can everybody imagine this? Okay. Now, the whole essence of Kinevin is you first work out what type of system you're in, and that determines the way you manage things. So I want to look at the children's party from these three types of system. So if we assume the system is chaotic, it means the children's behavior is entirely random. And if you made the mistake of holding the party in your own house, which is always a mistake, by the way, you know, the value of community centers is they have fire hoses, and fire hoses can be used for cleaning up after the party and are occasionally necessary for crowd control during the party itself. But if you're holding this party in your house and you just let the children play at random without constraints, yeah, I, mean, I have a friend who went to Burning Man who came back and organized a party like this in California. He's never going to do it again because he discovers spontaneous self-organization and spontaneous combustion come pretty close. Yeah? Um, so I don't recommend this approach. The ordered approach, on the other hand, you'll all be familiar with. Under this, it's of critical importance to agree a clear set of mission and value statements for the party in advance of the party itself. Those statements should be printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles throwing over valleys and water dropping into ponds and placed around the walls of the room where you're holding the party. Yeah? Uh, you, of course, have a project plan for the party. The project plan has clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcomes. And as the children come into the party, you give them Disney playing cards with the party value system printed on the back so that they're aware of them as you go through. Yeah, following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If for any remote reason the children aren't happy, then you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories, they have happy mental models, and suitably indoctrinated, they like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? <laughs> the complex systems approach, on the other hand, is very different. We start off by drawing a line in the sand, known as a boundary in complexity theory, and excuse one swear word here, but it's necessary, and we look the children squarely in the eye, and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. And one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, um, because rigid boundaries tend to break catastrophically. Then we'll drop a football or a barbecue or a computer game. It's called a catalyst, in the hope it creates a pattern of play, which is called an attractor. And if it's beneficial, we put more kids towards it. And if it's non-beneficial, that's where you deploy the fire hoses. So what we actually do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And we manage the only three things that you can manage in a complex adaptive system, which is basically, fundamentally, the boundaries, the catalysts, and the energy allocation. Life is a lot simpler when you realize you can't manage a complex system as it was ordered. So that's fundamentally Kinevin in terms of the way it works. The second framework, um, anybody remember market life cycle theory? Yeah, you basically have a curve which goes like that. And this is called the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and sad bastards. Oh, sorry, sorry, laggards, yeah? And the people who only buy things after everybody else has stopped buying them, yeah? Now, a guy called Jeffrey Moore came along with a brilliant idea. And if you haven't read Moore's Cross in the Chasm, I recommend it. He basically said this is a chasm. You go through this early stage in product adoption where the early adopters buy it and they want to know how it does it. Then one day, people want to know what it will do for them. They're no longer concerned how you do it. And most software companies miss that completely. So they, their revenue doesn't continue as projected. Either way, 
what I did was to take that and combine it. Um, I'm not going to go into this in much detail. Again, this is published. I combined it with S-curves. So I'll give you an example on this. IBM dominated the early computer market because they repurposed their expertise in punch card machines to create the first computer programs. Uh, this is called acceptation in biology. Repurposing something you're good at is the most successful strategy under conditions of stress, rather than inventing from scratch. So because of that, they dominated the early days of computing. And the trouble is, they were then what's called an apex predator. They were top of the food chain. So basically, I mean, nobody got fired from buying IBM. That was the rule. Yeah, they had the worst hardware and the worst software, but no, you know, they were the apex predator. So you wouldn't get fired for buying IBM, whereas you might get fired for buying something novel and new. And that's a characteristic which continues to this day. Nobody gets fired for implementing a McKinsey's report. It's the same strategy. Yeah? It's a matter of removing risk for executive decision makers. Then what happens is hardware becomes a commodity. And because IBM is the apex predator, they don't see it till it's too late. And they suffer catastrophic failure. Yeah? They, didn't, they actually recovered. They didn't disappear completely. But the whole of the European computer industry disappeared in about five years. It didn't survive that phase shift. Then Microsoft took over. Yeah, something small, inconsequential. They repurposed software they developed for IBM that IBM didn't own. That became Windows. Then software became a commodity. And our Apple took over. And this is a cycle of transition. Early adoption, commoditization, change. And the same applies in large companies. If you've got big organizational change programs, you have to wait for the old idea to die out before there's space for the new idea. And the problem is the old idea has reached the end of its utility, but it's still dominant. So it stops the new idea coming through. And that's this pit here. If you don't change in that time, this is the old idea dying. That's the new idea coming through. If you don't change in that period, you actually don't survive. And knowledge management teams have failed, in my experience, for the last 50 years, several times, because they just haven't recognized that. They've allowed themselves to become a commodity transaction-based process within the IT department, rather than something which is strategic, which changes the way things think. Right, so there's a sort of warning lesson in that for you. And then the final framework, and with this I'm going to draw to a close. And I'm trying to give you a flavor of a whole body of knowledge here. Um, because we can go into more depth later with anybody who wants afterwards. The only thing that I can really understand in a complex system are called constraints. And I'm using the model of an estuary deliberately because I got really fed up with people getting into constructional law and flow. The trouble with flow is everybody assumes everything will always flow in the right direction. It's the enlightenment myth of progress. Now, the reason I said an estuary is because the water comes in and the water goes back out again. Yeah? And there's things you can do at the turn of the tide that you can't do otherwise. And there are granite cliffs which aren't going to change, and you only have to check every now and then, but there are sandbanks you have to check every day. So it's a really good metaphor for the strategic context in which people work. That's a picture from an estuary in New Zealand, by the way. And so the way we started to approach in this, it comes out of the EU field guide, is we sort of all map the different constraints in play. Now, constraints are an important concept, and we use a typology for this. So three types of highly robust constraints, rigid constraints like seawalls, barriers, nothing can get through them. Um, elastic, that means what it says, if it snaps, it's painful. Yeah, but you've got some flexibility. Or if anybody's gone on the bridge over to, from San Diego to the Hotel Dell, you remember there's that big block which moves the concrete block. So I love that thing, all right? When just, I could watch that for ages. That's the flexible boundary. And then you have a tether, which is like a climbing rope Remember, at the age of 10, I got to the top of the Idwell slabs in North Wales, and the climbing instructor pushed me off at the top. You know, just when I was doing, oh, I'm wonderful, and boom, all right? I mean, they wouldn't be allowed to do that anymore. But I learned the value of a climbing rope or a tether pretty damn fast, all right, on that day. And it stayed with me ever since. No? And then we have resilient constraints, which are fairly simple. Again, three. Um, we have basically one end something which is permeable, some things can get through, some things can't. Phase shift, sorry about this, that was really difficult to explain to people until Roe v. Wade, now everybody understands it. There's something in the system which can create a radical shift which is unpredictable. 
And then the thing I'm particularly proud of, a dark constraint, that's a reference to dark energy in cosmology, so dark matter in cosmology. We can see the impact of a constraint, but we can't see what the constraint is. Uh, sea level executives love that one, by the way, because most of their life is in that space. So we map those constraints. We do that. We can do it with software. We can do it in a workshop. A typology forces people to think differently, and if you want to know the difference between a typology and taxonomy, go to Patrick Lamb, because I'm not going to explain it with him sat in the audience in front of me. All right. um, basically, we then create a grid which does energy cost of change against, sorry, energy cost of change against time to change. Because energy and time are the significant factor, and either with software or with people, we map the constraints onto that map. Now, now this is really important because we're starting to look at things which are concrete and tangible and what would it cost to change them in terms of energy which could be money or, or resource and how long would it take to change them in terms of the way it works. This comes from constructor theory in physics, by the way. We then draw what's called the counterfactual line. So things this side of the line aren't going to change. The energy cost of change or the time to change is just too much. So realistically, we can't do, we can't do anything about them. Right? I've, in workshops, I've seen executives negotiate that line for two or three hours. Just drawing the line makes them think differently about things and they move things around, so that's valuable. And then we create monitors on that line because if it ever changes, we want to know quite fa fast. And we also identify a few constraints over here, forward scouts. If they start to change, it gives us early warning that we might face a situation which we can't handle. And then we draw down here the vulnerability line. Everything to the left of that, effectively, it can change instantly with no energy cost. Staff leaving your company is a good example of that. Yeah, if you've got a vulnerability here, it's a high impact constraint, you need to put a containment strategy in place very quickly. What I've now got is a set of micro-projects to contain dangerous things and a set of micro-projects to monitor the boundary. And then in the space between, I decide which of those constraints I want to keep, what I want to get rid of, what I want to amend. And the more of those constraints which I understand, the more I control the space. And the fundamental principle is whatever has the lowest energy gradient will win. And this is a whole new approach to strategy. We don't say where we want to go, we change the situation so that the things we want cost less energy than the things we don't want. And that actually allows for self-organization. And that is a radical shift in strategy, but it's a lot easier to actually do. And if you want a theme on this, yeah, um, the way I normally explain it is how many people have seen Frozen 2? Okay, if you haven't, go and watch it. It's a great complexity movie, all right? And, you know, you don't need kids or grandchildren anymore. But Professor Snowden told you it was a complexity movie and you've got to watch it, all right? So I'm giving you your excuse. All right? In the middle of that movie, the real heroine of the movie series, who's the younger sister without the magic, yeah, basically is in a situation of despair. And coming back to my hope theme from the start, she thinks she's lost a sister, lost a mentor, and she thinks this absolutely beautiful song. All I can do is do the next right thing. In complexity, that's called the adjacent possible. And the conditions of uncertainty, you can't say where you want to go, but you can describe where you are, and you can identify where you can step next. And that means we start journeys with a sense of direction rather than trying to achieve goals. And that's important for people in IT, in knowledge management, and elsewhere. The Astro model is now going public, by the way. It's all open source. And the final thing I want to sort of lead you with yeah, is this is the, the origin of the word English. In this comes from the Italian, uh, which is the ability to ride a horse in dressage. Uh, as a word, it then gets corrupted by the French. Uh, many things have been corrupted by the French. <laughs> Not as many as have been corrupted by the English, yeah, but that's a, a, a high standard anyway, to mean household management. And those pictures, if you haven't seen the White Horse of Uffington, that's a Neolithic carving on a hill just north of where I live. And it captures, the, that's a whole hillside, it captures the essence of a horse. Yeah? And that's Mrs. Beaton's rules of household management, which was given by my grandfather by my, to my mother 
but he didn't think she was capable of looking after his son. And it describes everything you ever need to do in terms of managing a household with no, with, in a completely prescriptive way. It's quite fascinating to read it. Rules heuristics, yeah? Riding a horse, managing a household budget. It's a both and, not an either or. So in the EU field guide, we basically talk about three things that you should try and do. One is build informal networks. The other is use your employees as a human sensor network. You need real-time feedback loop. We can talk about that on the stand if anybody's interested. That map I drew for you earlier, the colored contour map, that's the result of a five-minute consultation of all staff. So the ability to get real-time feedback in real time, that makes knowledge management strategic rather than just operational in terms of your capability. And the final one, which links to Fletcher's curves, you need to map what you know at the right level of granularity so you can repurpose it very quickly. The famous case on this is a Raytheon engineer realized the significance of a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. Yeah, so he put a metal box around the magneto of the radar machine he was maintaining. We got microwave ovens. IBM repurposed punch card technology. Don't map what you know in taxonomies and structured. We use high abstraction metadata. Map what you know at the right level of granularity so you can encounter things serendipitously rather than by purpose. Yeah? Accidental encounter produces more innovation for humans than deliberate search. And managing for serendipity is something we focused on for 30 or 40 years. And it's kind of like a key function. So that's where I wanted to finish. I think I've managed the time reasonably well. Yeah? Um, I hope that was useful. Yeah, we've got a stand. People can come and ask more questions. Every single method I've talked about is in kinevin.io. It's open source. Feel free to use it. Thank you very much for your time.